Okay, so I'm just going to start at this end of the table. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Andrew Ray. He is a physical therapist and a PhD in exercise physiology. He's a clinical assistant professor in the School of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Buffalo uh, in the uh, Department of Rehabilitation Science. Uh, his um, research is in the relationship um, of the respiratory muscle system uh, and uh, exercise performance uh, in health and disease. He is an integral part of the research going forward uh, here at Roswell with survivors in terms of fighting fatigue with exercise. He has a very sp uh, specific um, you know, uh, routine that he uh, gets patients to go through, uh, and we have seen remarkable results we are pushing this model into the prehabilitation to precondition people before surgery. Uh, I think this is just an excellent um, opportunity. This is new for us, but this is uh, really cutting edge um, uh, research. Um, so this is Andrew Ray. Uh, the next is uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Sagar. Did I say that right? Yes. So I think you met him yesterday. I'm really excited that he's here. He's a full professor uh, in the departments of oncology and medicine at McMaster University uh, in Canada, just across the border. He is in the, uh, uh, the Jervininsky Cancer Center. And his uh, work, um, through many manuscripts and book chapters, uh, his first book, Restored Harmony, uh, was a seminal publication um, to uh, introducing cancer patients to uh, Chinese medicine. Uh, he is really uh, in the forefront of uh, bringing this integrated mind-body um, uh, um, treatment to cancer patients, and we're very lucky to have uh, such an expert here. And so, you know, welcome, Stephen. Um, the next person here uh, is uh, Dr. Tracy O'Connor, um, who uh, is in the, um, a breast cancer oncologist. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine here at Roswell. Um, and her uh, areas of expertise are breast cancer. But she, um, has, um, she is a great model of a, a young, intelligent, inquisitive oncologist because she is really seeking out ways to bring novel treatments into both the treatment of breast cancer, the psychological impact of, uh, of breast cancer, and uh, support therapies for patients with advanced disease. Um, she is the epitome of commitment to her patients, and um, I really appreciate her taking her time on a Saturday after a busy week in clinic uh, to come. So welcome, uh, Tracy. Um, okay, um, the next person here is um, Carol uh, uh, Deyashian, who is an RD, a PhD, um, who is an associate professor and the department chair at um, Buff State in, in nutrition and exercise. She's also an adjunct um, professor here at Roswell, and she is a frequent um, member of our research teams in nutrition and exercise intervention. Uh, for example, a new protocol where we're changing the clinical pathway for pa patients who've had their bladders removed to give them nutrition and exercise support pre-treatment uh, and post-treatment. Uh, she, her, her uh, research includes nutrition and exercise intervention in cancer and chronic disease, uh, body composition. Uh, she is really a leader in this community as well as an academic uh, nutritionist, and uh, we're really happy to have her as part of our research team and here today, so welcome. Um, next is uh, Maria Khan, uh, who is, um, a, has her degree in philosophy at uh, Buffalo State College uh, with an emphasis in Eastern philosophy. Uh, in its practical applications. Uh, she is a, a frequent um, person, a resource for uh, Roswell. 
Um, at the ride a few years ago, she ran a mindfulness workshop with uh, maxed out at 200 uh, survivors and their families uh, to start their mindfulness training. Um, she uh, trained under Dr. Uh, George Hull, who's a distinguished professor in philosophy and counseling. Uh, um, she has um, started a, a, a program, the first mindfulness program for the Institute in the Shipboard Education semester at sea. Uh, she uh, counsels uh, faculty and staff in developing coping strategies uh, for students. Um, she really brings a very skilled um, set of um, uh, both from a mindfulness meditation and a, a, a Eastern philosophy into treatment and, um, and counseling for cancer patients. We are very lucky to have this resource in our community and we welcome you on the panel. So thank you. Um, and lastly, um, but not least, uh, is uh, Lynn um, Ibe, who is a 27-year cancer survivor. Uh, she's a journalist, uh, a retired patient advocate. Uh, she um, started the Cancer Prayer Support Group uh, in 1991. She's an author of several books, including When God and Cancer Meet, um, and, uh, and her new book, Peace in the Face of Cancer, was released in April. Uh, she has also been a frequent um, uh, resource for Roswell. And um, again, uh, we're very lucky to have her on the panel. Um, we know uh, everyone um, who's been touched by cancer knows that spirituality is a big component of how you both deal with the life-threatening nature of cancer and moving forward. And so we're really lucky to have her on the panel. So welcome, Lynn. Okay, so if you want to start, uh, Andy, start with your introduction, and then um, when it's all done, we'll open it up for questions. Morning. Thank you for having me here. Let me begin by saying I am a physical therapist. I have a PhD in exercise physiology, and around 10, 11 years ago, my sister was diagnosed with lung cancer. Unfortunately, she passed. She was 38 years old, and... At that time, I got to know Mary, and I said, I don't know how I can help with my skill set, but it turns out I can help a lot. As a, a PT and an exercise physiologist, I can help you get through treatment. Exercise can reduce symptoms. It can prevent symptoms. It can help you withstand more treatment. So it will improve your survival rate. There's a physiatrist from Harvard University, Julie Silver, who estimates up to 90% of patients would benefit from rehab services, but they don't get it. And it's not because they're withheld from it, it's just everyone's so busy. And this came up last night, and it's up to you as the patient sometimes to ask for it. But if you have comorbidities going into treatment, if you have weakness, if you have muscle aches and pains and other issues going on, PT can address those issues. Exercise physiologists who are trained in the area can address those issues and they can help you. I run a, a, a small kind of program where, because of my sister in lung cancer, I have a, a special attachment to that, where we train patients before surgery and I see them in a clinic and I help them get through surgery. We have a protocol that I can address within two to three weeks because sometimes surgery comes up so quickly. And with our protocol, we can actually reduce the length of stay in the hospital and, and decrease the amount of services that are required for those patients afterwards. And we're trying to do that on a larger research scale now, but we've been pretty successful. I was trained in the respiratory system, so I kind of like that, and one of the issues that I see is if the respiratory system becomes involved, you experience symptoms such as shortness of breath and fatigue. By eliminating those two things, we can help you exercise more and be more active. So don't forget to ask your oncologist, ask your physicians if you have issues, if you want to see an exercise person, a nutritionist, a physical therapist. Rehab can start early, it can start during treatment, 
and it can definitely start after, and there's a benefit associated with all of it. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I look forward to seeing people in my session later this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, so I'm actually an oncologist. I specialize in radiation oncology now. When I trained in the United Kingdom, uh, one year before uh, I finished my training and uh, became a staff oncologist, my mother died of pancreatic cancer. And it was probably the most important uh, training period of my life. I took two months off and uh, nursed her while she died. And it made a huge difference to me, that personal exposure to a, a loved one uh, dying. And it made one realize all the nuances that go far beyond the technical treatment of cancer. Uh, when I came to Canada uh, in, in, in the early, uh, when was that, 1994, 95, patients were starting to talk about uh, complementary and alternative therapies, everything from extreme what seemed to be bogus therapies to therapies that seemed to be quite useful, such as acupuncture. Uh, so at that point, uh, I saw that there was a part of our technical uh, industrial medicine that was missing uh, and started to explore these therapies by going on courses myself. Uh, in, the, in, in the end, I wrote a book from a perspective of Chinese medicine, which I saw uh, as a holistic model that could be brought in, not in its Chinese form, but in a Western form uh, to uh, North America. And so I published a book called Restored Harmony uh, in the year 2000. Now, there are some copies there. If anybody wants to take one for free, feel free to take one away afterwards. Um, and from there on, um, it, came, it became quite clear that there was a lot of evidence uh, missing, uh, that a lot of this was traditional medicine. And th therefore, I made it a main subject of my research program, which basically started off on tumor oxygenation and uh, looking at the effects of radiation and radiation sensitizers, went on to uh, Chinese herbs, whether they could be created into pharmaceutical derivatives, and also uh, with my colleague Raymond Wong, on uh, acupuncture studies. S uh, in the end, we actually, and it takes a long time to bring these studies in, it, they require a lot of uh, ethics approval, quality assurance, funding of course, but in the end we, we brought forward a big study to the Radiotherapy Oncology Group, uh, which was completed a few years ago, on the role of uh, acupuncture, like TENS, which is electrical stimulation of acupuncture points on xerostomia, which was uh, completed as a randomized controlled trial. It was actually the, the quickest recruiting trial that the radiotherapy oncology group at that time had ever done. Everybody was so interested, and it involved ancillary practitioners such as nurses, technologists, and it really provided a team effort for focusing on the patient on relieving their symptoms of uh, dry mouth. So that was eventually published uh, in uh, one of the well-known radiation oncology journals, which is quite a breakthrough because when I started off, I really this subject wasn't taken very seriously at all, and it is taken extremely seriously. So my model of uh, integrative care is probably, in my opinion, how it should be. Now, there are major centers like Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, and, of course, MD Anderson that have a separate uh, integrative care consultation, and that's fine. But it really, it's not practical for the majority of centers. And in a sense, it takes away the whole uh, important aspect of what is integrative care. It should be a blending of evidence-based and humanistic-based medicine that actually orientates around the uh, major consultation with your uh, medical or radiation oncologist, et cetera, or surgical oncologist. So we've tended to incorporate it into the initial consultation with the uh, nurse and physician team. And we, the most important thing we start off with, with is um, introduction to patient's evaluation of knowledge because we encourage our patients, we have a patient-centered care program which encourages our patients to actually seek knowledge and then discuss it with us. And I know that's time consuming, but at the end of the day, if you empower your patients from the start, actually it enables your patients to become more self-sufficient, or you are patients, but anybody, whether I could be a patient, it enables me to be more self-sufficient if I know about what the problem is and where to seek the knowledge and what knowledge is credible. So that is our main model. We do use symptom screening tools so that when patients come in electronically, uh, they will actually assess what their symptoms are. They, we will get a, a chart 
um, a printout, and we can use that basically as, as a discussion point for you if you come for a consultation. We can see that you're particularly anxious, which is pretty normal in the first consultation, or you have depressive symptoms or respiratory symptoms, whatever. It gives us a, a, a place to start from. And then really it's a question of triaging, and that is going to vary between centers. If you're lucky to have an expert on exercise here, we actually have to triage out, out to the YMCA or the, or the, or, or the um, exercise uh, facilities run by voluntary organizations. Uh, we have social worker counseling, uh, and we have dietitians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but from the point of view of uh, such therapists, if I can call them therapists, not, I, it, Again, there's controversy, but such supportive means as meditation, group therapies, yoga, we do have a voluntary center that actually brings in professionals who volunteer their time to actually take patients in group sessions for that. So we can triage out to our organization called Wellwood, which is purely run on uh, donations. Um, when it comes to natural health products, it's a difficult subject. We try and avoid them. Patients ask questions about them. In general, during treatment, we avoid natural health products because we really don't know the interactions um, completely and we don't know whether they have huge benefits. There's ongoing research to look at that, but I don't really think we've got to the point where we can really integrate natural health products. Uh, there's some evidence of safety, for example, using immune stimulants such as maitake mushroom or astragalus, and some centers, including Sloan Kettering, uh, will use that as an option if patients want it. But it's important that we look at everything a patient's taking before they come and assess whether there could potentially be adverse effects and is it safe to take these products together with their uh, treatment. And I just want to finally uh, mention um, one of the audience yesterday brought up uh, aspects of uh, existentialism and uh, spirituality, which is not my uh, expertise. We have uh, others here that are experts on that. But I, I forgot to mention that, I mean, there are two good books on this business of why did I get cancer. First thing I want to mention, even if you got cancer because you smoked your life, even if you got cancer because you, you felt you did something wrong, the most important role that I have as an oncologist is to say do not feel guilty and to get rid of that guilt. You should not feel guilty. You are where you are now. What's happened beforehand is not your fault. Genes, environment, it's not your fault. However, what can we do about it from now on? But then there are those who come and say, well, I've done everything right and it's still gone wrong. Uh, there are two, two, two important books that you can read. One is by Viktor Frankl, uh, which he talks about logotherapy, and he was a survivor of the Holocaust. And the other, in fact, is a, also Jewish, who's a Harold Kushner, who wrote the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And these may be good books to help. And sometimes it's good to t send people away with the books, and then they come back and discuss uh, what they feel about the narratives in those books with their practitioner. It's never important to send somebody away with a book and not give them a chance to come back and give uh, feedback. So, as you can see, we have rather an eclectic uh, system which is spread between different departments and requires triaging. And I think it's up to uh, every center to decide, along with their resources and budgets and their topography where their centers are in their community, uh, how to actually run their system. But the important thing is to not to divide it up into silos, is to make it a seamless system which comes under the umbrella of patient-centered care. Thank you. Hi, my name's Tracy O'Connor. I'm a breast medical oncologist um, in the breast clinic at Roswell, which practically means that I give women with breast cancer chemotherapy and anti-estrogen therapy and spend a lot of time um, doing follow-up and managing quality of life after treatment. Um, I'm thrilled that I'm still called young because I've been here an astounding 15 years. <laughs> um, I think most young medical oncologists are attracted to the field of oncology because of the potential for delivering curative therapy. Um, and it's very exciting and oncology continues to be an exciting field. But I quickly learned that helping people to die with comfort, symptom control and dignity was every bit as important as helping my patients to live and that many people after their treatment were left with ongoing side effects. Um, the traditional mantra in oncology was, well, you're alive, so you just have to cope with it, even though you're no longer able to have intercourse with your partner because of you know, vaginal atrophy, but we're not going to worry about it. 
Um, and that was really dissatisfying to me because I felt that helping women to live um, after their treatment was every bit as important as administering their curative therapy. So I rapidly um, <coughs> became involved in some uh, research aspects looking at helping to support uh, survivors um, and have been involved in developing the NCCN guidelines for survivorship, which is pretty much an amazing document that is now many hundreds of patient, uh, patients' pages long um, and available on the internet for both patients and their providers, wherever you may get your care. Um, so I'm thrilled to be part of the survivorship program here at Roswell. I'm very hopeful that this will allow uh, patients to access services that for a long time have simply been um, difficult to organize and for many to afford. Um, I've long been a proponent of Pilates as a great rehab medicine model for many of my patients, but my Pilates class is $55 an hour. Um, and it's not really accessible for many people who come to see me for treatment. Um, so I'm hopeful that through Mary's efforts and the efforts of um, Roswell Park and our donors, we'll be able to offer many more uh, therapies to help support patients that will be much more affordable and more centrally located. Um, so I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. It's usually lively and interesting, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Good morning. I'm Carol Donation, as was introduced, and asking me to limit talking about exercise and nutrition to five minutes is like asking a two-year-old to sit through a 50-minute lecture. It doesn't work very well. But I have a handy watch, and I'm going to take it off and put it in front of me, although the last time I did this, I forgot to see what time I started. So I'm not guaranteeing this, would, this will work. So thank you for being here. And the first thing I wanted to do, I was going to save this for the end, but I thought, you know, it's more poignant at the beginning. Here is a pill bottle, and I'm going to tell everyone out there that thinks there's a magic pill for good nutrition and or exercise. If you shake this, it's empty, and if I open it up, it is empty. There is no magic pill. It depends on you. Now, with that, I want to mention don't be despaired when you think about, oh, I've got this much weight to lose, or oh, I can't resist those beautiful brownies. That's life. And what you want to do is you want to make short-term goals. Start small. The more short-term goals you achieve, the more confidence you're going to gain. For example, you could once a week decide, I am going to have a meatless meal, or I, five days a week, I'm going to make sure two-thirds of my plate is plant-based foods. Kudos to you. If you do that, you're going to find it, it becomes easier and easier to do. It's a small change, but it speaks volumes for what you can do with your diet and when you incorporate exercise into that. Maybe you want to switch out rich desserts twice a week. Start small. Do it twice a week. Have fruit instead or yogurt twice a week. Then build that up to more and more. Think about not drinking your calories. If you have maybe excess weight you want to lose, one of the biggest things you can do is ensure you're not drinking your calories unless they are nutrient-dense calories. I'm not talking about the Starbucks Frappuccino. That is not nutrient-dense. It's calorie-dense, but it's not nutrient-dense. And do you know how many times I walk into a Tim Hortons, et cetera, and I see people walk out with a large Frappuccino and a bagel, and I sit there thinking, geez, that's about 600 calories, 700 calories that people don't even realize they're consuming. So think about small. Think about not drinking your calories unless it's something nutrient-dense. And the biggest thing I have to say, too, with that, you cannot uncouple nutrition with physical activity. So ask your physician first. Make sure it's approved. But you need to make sure you're moving. It's very, very important. You will find your appetite will decrease the more you move. You'll start thinking about healthier foods the more you move. They go hand in hand. Some people have a taste aversion after their chemo or with certain medications. Some of the things you can do with that is try different spices. Sometimes they help. Drink sips of water between your bites of food. That also helps. Coffee, tea, generally increase taste aversions. So you may want to think about cutting back on those beverages. Silverware, believe it or not, sometimes metal silverware will enhance the taste aversions people have. Try switching to plastic until you get over those taste aversions. Biggest thing is try and eat fresh fruits, foods versus canned. 
Vegetables, it's easy, it's great if you can't have any other access, but it's easier to open a can, but try to go, especially now, farmers markets, etc. try fresh over frozen or canned. Now, how can you, maybe you have lost weight lately and you want to gain it back, how can you do that quickly or, easy, or beneficially? Think about what you put in your mouth matters. You want to make sure you're consuming good sources of protein, good sources of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not your enemy, people. They are not your enemy. They are good for you. They give you energy, but you want to switch to whole grains. Couple that with your physical activity, you'll be on a good road to increasing your body weight healthy and the, the proper way. And two other things that I wanted to say before they are going to kick me under the table is Keep this in mind for your long-term range goals. Keep in mind that every pound of body fat is about 3,500 calories. So you have a quantitative measure now. Okay, so to lose one pound a week, you think that's not enough. That's beautiful. A half a pound a week is beautiful. Because what that tells you is every day for seven days in a row, if I decrease my calorie intake by 500 calories, that's a lot, people. Or I can couple it with physical activity, and I don't have to decrease my intake quite so much. And I can you do that for seven days. I'm going to lose a pound of body fat. You want to go slow. You want to be measured. And when you think about exercise, because I'm a big proponent of exercise with that healthy diet, shoot for that 30 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be all at once. You, what you want to do is try to get some vigorous exercise in there. If you're starting out with just moderate exercise or low impact, that's fine too. But the secret is you're moving. By the way, the more you move, the less you're putting things in your mouth. So it's a good tip too. And with that, you're going to find that your fatigue level and the quality of your life is going to go up because you're going to feel better all over. So don't uncouple nutrition with physical activity. And I'd be happy to answer questions after. Thank you. Hey, Carol, can I, can I add one thing to that? Yes. As I look into the crowd, and I thank you for talking about physical activity, there's one thing I, I see that I think most people can do is, is take that walk every day. Absolutely. Getting your, getting your steps, the yeah, evidence shows if you go from three to 4,000 steps a day, you're going to have a health benefit. We shoot for 10,000 steps a day. Don't go from one to 10 baby steps. Small goals, just like Carol said. But you all have the ability to do that. I know it's a little rough in the winter. We could find other ways to do it around here, but it's the best way to start. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maria Khan, and I'm an um, applied mindfulness specialist. I teach mindfulness and meditation. And I'm actually going to explain to you how non doing and non activity can actually beneficial, be beneficial to your health and well being. So, a combination of physical activity and a combination of being mindful and meditating, taking that time to stop, does help in, in the healing process. So the best way to understand how mindfulness and meditation work is to really look at how we stress as humans when we're diagnosed with a disease or we're, we're thinking about you know, um, getting into remission. There's, there's a lot of stress and strain on us. Um, a lot of that occurs in the mind. And when we stress as humans, we ignite our body's fight or flight response system. This fight or flight response system is critical to our survival during a clearly perceived present moment danger. So we have this fight or flight response system to help us in a life-saving crisis. Something like that would be running out of a burning building, saving yourself from drowning, escaping an attacker. And when this fight or flight response system is ignited in our body, there's about 1,800 changes that happen in the body. Some of the things you may or may not notice is hormones are released from the brain into the body, your heart rate increases, your breath rate increases, your muscles become tense, ready for action, blood sugar level rise to give you that burst of energy. Digestion and reproduction begin to slow down and sometimes with chronic stress stop. And the same goes for growth and healing, growth and healing stop. And when I'm showing this on a slide, I always highlight the last two, this um, digestion and reproduction stop and growth and healing stop. 20 years ago, we couldn't get Prilosec over the counter was something that you had to go to your doctor and get. And now there are many, many digestive aids that are available to us over the counter. 
Also, reproductive issues in both men and women are at an all-time high without any cl clearly perceived diagnosis of a problem. So um, people just not being able to get pregnant. And diseases that our grandparents have never heard of, a lot of autoimmune disease are starting to pop all, up, all over the place. And, and this is because as a society, we are stressing more than ever. It's very interesting how our society has become so convenient for us, we really have to barely leave the house to do anything, to pay a bill, or you can even have food delivered to your house. You, know, you don't even have to grocery shop. It's very convenient. Yet we all seem to be stressing at the highest level that we've ever been in our society. And as a result, we're seeing a lot of these illnesses pop up due to chronic stress. So how does mindfulness and meditation work? in terms of combating and allowing you to manage that stress. Um, back in the 70s, Dr. Herbert Benson discovered the relaxation response. And he discovered this response, ironically, at Harvard Medical School in the same room that 30, 40 years earlier, they discovered the stress response system. And what he did was he took people that had meditated for a long time, like 20-year meditators, and hooked them up to all the uh, measurements of the stress response system, heart rate, blood pressure. He even, he even tested hormone levels and also the way that genes express themselves in the body before and after meditation. And what he found was that anything that was being turned up due to stress, that activation of the fight or flight response, when you meditated was actually being turned down. So the more somebody meditated, the more they were activating this relaxation response and bringing the body back into balance. So he thought that was interesting with people that had meditated for 20 years, he decided to repeat the study on people that had never made it, meditated before. And he instructed them in a 15 minute breathing meditation, hooked them up to the stress response measurements. And what he found was after just one time of meditating, they experienced the same response. So in terms of meditation, we can act formally. You can think of this as physical exercise. So it would be like formally going to the gym, formally taking your seat and listening to a guided meditation, or using your breath as an anchor and, and following your breath and activating this relaxation response for you. Informal meditation, and in terms of mindfulness meditation, would be doing this as you're moving about in life. So recognizing when you're activating that fight or flight response system. I check, I check this out every time I get in the grocery line. You know, we always seem to be in a hurry, we wanna get through a line. And if you start to pay attention to where your mind is at, we realize that our mind is rarely in the present moment. We're usually worrying about the past, maybe thinking about well, why, why did this happen to me? Why are things so bad now? Um, what could I have done differently? Sort of dwelling that causes us to dwell in some kind of depressive rumination. Or we're thinking about the future, anxiety, um, especially in terms of being diagnosed with an illness. You know, um, is this gonna come back? Am I gonna be able to get back to work? Is my body gonna be able to work the same? And when you, our minds and body are completely entrained to work together. So our bodies can't tell the difference between I'm thinking about a problem that is worrisome and challenging or I'm about to get eaten by a lion. There's, there's no difference. It doesn't differentiate. So if you are thinking about and worrying about um, a problem that may be happening in the future, your body actually interprets that as it's happening now. So where mindfulness would come in informally is to teach you to be aware of where your mind is at. And I give my students a little, one little simple check-in. Ask yourself throughout the day, where am I right now? Where am I right here, right now in this moment? And I ask them to answer the question twice. The first time, where is your mind? Just simply noticing where your mind is at, not getting into any analyzation or um, judgment about <coughs> where your mind was, just simply noticing. And then answering the question, where is my body? Our body is dependable for us to always check into and reground ourselves into the present moment. So no matter where your mind is, 10 minutes into the past or 20 minutes into the future, your body always remains present. So as you bring your mind and body into the same place at the same moment, you actually activate that body's natural relaxation response. So it doesn't matter if you do it for a couple of seconds or for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I will say that the benefits happen with consistent practice. So doing something as simple as sitting down and doing a 15 minute meditation every day 
will actually be incredibly life-changing to you. And then also paying attention to where your mind is throughout the day, noticing when it's wandered, checking into where you're at, regrounding in your body will also activate that relaxation response. Okay. So a little bit of meditation. There's a lot of apps available now. Um, there's a lot of teachers around Western New York. I'm happy to be here at Roswell teaching, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. In 1990, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer at the age of 36. My daughters were eight, 10, and 12. My husband's first wife had died some 20 years earlier from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, while they were newlyweds. A friend of mine came into the hospital after my cancer surgery, and I remember a big smile on her face, and she said, God is gonna teach you great things through this trial. I remember thinking I wanted to rip the IV out of my arm, stab it in her arm, and say, you get into the bed and learn great things from God. I'm not interested in learning that way. It's 27 years later, and through nearly two decades of working as an oncology patient advocate and meeting thousands of cancer patients and their caregivers, I must admit that my friend was right. I have learned great things from God. I have learned them because suffering is a great teacher, but it's one class I would have rather skipped. I know there are very many different uh, definitions of spirituality, and in five minutes here it's impossible for me to cover that gamut. But for most of the people that I have met, thousands of cancer patients, 3,000 new ones I met in my job, most believe in an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And it actually can be more difficult to deal with cancer when that's your belief than if you don't believe in God. It might be tough for you as it once was for me to come to terms with the fact that God has allowed adversity in your life or your loved one. My author friend David Beeble talks about this in his book, If God is so good, why do I hurt so bad? He says there are two truths that suffering people have to reconcile. Sometimes life is agony and a loving God is in control. Think about it. If God knows everything, cancer diagnosis didn't surprise him. If God sees everything, he saw the bad news coming. If God has power over everything, he could have stopped it, but he didn't. He didn't stop you or your loved one from getting cancer. He didn't prevent it from happening to me or the thousands of others that are diagnosed every day. For some folks, this, is a se this seeming contradiction is a short-term challenge. They fairly quickly come to terms with it but for others it can remain a long-term challenge as they try to feel God's love in spite of the unfairness of life. I have learned great truths from God through my cancer trial in spite of, not because of my friend's insensitive comment that day in the hospital. I know my friend meant well, and I've had to remind myself to hear her heart and not her words, but it was very inappropriate I believe, for her to try to make sense of my suffering for me. People often make that mistake. They preach about this or that. They tell you why it all happened. If you know the story of Job in the Bible, that's what his friends did to him. But nobody is God. They can't see the big picture. They don't know the total plan for your life. I think it makes other people feel better to imagine they know why something bad happened to you. Somehow then it's not going to happen to them. I don't think it makes us cancer patients feel better. You may have many spiritual questions regarding your cancer journey or your loved ones. Some of those questions have no easy answer. People who say everything happens for a reason, I believe probably haven't knelt beside a little child with cancer or sat in a chemo chair by a young mother fighting for her life or stood with grieving parents whose teenager has succumbed to the disease. I have been in all those situations, and that's why you won't find me trying to explain to you any rationale for you or your loved one's diagnosis. 
I have plenty of questions for God myself. But because I do believe God is all loving, all knowing, and all powerful, I think he's a safe place to turn with our questions about suffering. I think one of two things will happen. He'll either give us the answers we seek or he'll give us the peace to live with the questions. If you or someone you love has been diagnosed with cancer, I doubt you are rejoicing over the possibilities of what you can learn through this suffering. <laughs> but I hope you are praying and believing that God can't touch you, whoever you are, right where you are. Newly diagnosed and in shock, praying there's been some mistake. Facing surgery, praying the doctor can get it all. Trudging through chemotherapy, radiation, praying they work. And dealing with the recurrence, praying it's been caught soon enough. Undergoing tests, praying for some good news, finally. At the end of medical hope, praying for a little more time. Holding the hand of a loved one, praying to be strong for them. Living as a survivor, praying to find the light in cancer shadow. Whatever cancer category you fit into, there are short and long-term challenges as you help write the next chapter in your life. In my workshop this afternoon, I'll offer 10 choices that you can make to see what happens when God and cancer meet. Thank you. Wow. Um, so uh, if you, um, we have runners with um, the microphones. So if you want the microphone to be delivered or you can get up and stretch and come to one of the standing microphones, I would ask that you uh, kind of limit the number of questions so that everyone has an opportunity uh, to ask. But, um, you know, if you want the, we already have someone with the mic. Uh, please um, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And identify who you're asking the question to. Hi, my name is Sonia, and I'm a four-year cancer survivor. And I have a question. I, I think I want to address it to kind of everybody. Um, so much of the experience of being diagnosed with cancer, being treated for cancer, and then continuing to survive after the fact is a traumatic experience. It's invasive. The, the treatment is invasive. It's extremely and profoundly personal. If anyone has who's going through it has a history of uh, trauma in their life up to that point, it's only going to be exacerbated. And I'm thinking about how psychologically um, that can powerfully interfere with wellness. So I guess I'd like to hear from everyone. Is there incorporated in the survivorship and the work that you do a trauma-informed pr perspective with everyone who walks through the door? Thank you. Um, I agree with you that any uh, baseline things that you bring to the treatment table tend to get exacerbated with the stress of cancer. Um, we definitely have a very robust psychology program with some very talented people working um, within it. I cannot speak to whether or not they have um, precise trauma-based approach um, to every patient, but certainly um, they are very accomplished in um, treating cancer patients and helping them through um, their treatment and helping to support them and when we need to, um, also aiding with medications. So it is something that is a component of our program. For me personally, one of the things that I find most frustrating is because of the stigma, probably not from the people in this room um, who are pretty open to exploring better ways um, to live after treatment, um, but the stigma of going to see a psychologist or getting that some kind of support sometimes keeps many people who would benefit from it um, from pursuing it. And the greatest frustration I have in my practice is trying to get women to accept the help that it's really clear that they need and could benefit from but are resistant to accepting because they're worried it makes them seem weak um, or frail. So I think as a community, we all need to work together to try to um, support each other and help normalize these experiences so that people can get the help that they need. Oh, Stephen. Uh, thank you for that question. It's a very important question, and there are many reasons why it's important. One reason is that um, People who've had previous trauma and that come for cancer treatment uh, are the most likely people to 
uh, either not come back and get their treatment or not to actually fulfill uh, their treatment by, you know, for example, getting appropriate doses of chemotherapy. They, they, they're much more sensitive to uh, uh, the side effects of treatment. So it's, it's really important that, they, that anybody who has had previous types of trauma, CPTSD or PTSD, um, is counseled appropriately and sometimes given appropriate medication to enable them to get through. And I have to say that uh, as a member of the uh, International Psychology Association that there are clear guidelines for that, but it's very few cancer centers around the whole world that have actually uh, incorporated uh, the uh, four resources of uh, psychology. And uh, as my colleague just said, it's often separated from the cancer program. So instead of being part of a psycho-oncology program where it doesn't appear as though you're stigmatized because you're part of the overall program, so, you know, you're often referred to a psychiatric hospital to see a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist. So your point is a very important point, and I hope that uh, patients will push more for the psychological support services by mental health professionals to be incorporated into their actual cancer centers. Um, Stephen, just as a follow-up, do you have a, do you specifically ask about prior history? Um, um, of... You know, it's, um, there's, a, there's an art to medicine and there's a science to medicine. Um, um, I, some people are more sensitive at picking up from patients. Um, that they've had previous issues. Uh, um, I'm not trying to create any hubris, but I'm quite sensitive at doing that. It just comes naturally to me. Um, but what I do find is that um, when we have discussions about patients uh, and we have multidisciplinary discussions, you're all discussed by various specialists when we're designing options for programs to present to you. That some patients are very difficult, some patients, uh, what we call difficult, we don't mean that in a nasty way, but you know, a patient may be very uh, angry, or, the pa or somebody may be uh, very anxious. Some people get out of the room, they may storm into the room and say, hey, I've been waiting for 10 minutes, I'm fed up with waiting. You have to ask yourself the question, why are they behaving like that? And often it's because they're frightened. If people are angry, if people are seem to be difficult, it's because they're frightened and anxious. So what I teach my colleagues, because I'm interested in the topic, is that if somebody is behaving outside of the norm, it's because they have an issue that needs to be discussed. So I would go in there and say, hey, things must be really awful for you. You feel distressed, you look angry, and I understand that. Would you like to tell me more about that? And then they'll open up and tell you about, for example, they had a previous nasty experience where they, they got pain during a procedure, for example, or they were abused as a uh, child or whatever. Uh, so I think it's important that clinicians, whether you're nurses, physicians, therapists, technologists, are sensitive to the patient who is looking angry and anxious, usually has an issue that they want to discuss with you, and to provide that as a non judge oh. I didn't do it. <laughs> So we have, uh, do you want to stand up and ask your question? Oh, you don't have to stand up, it's okay. Okay. Um, I was wondering what in your particular fields you would recommend for cancer survivors who are dealing with chronic daily pain? One of the things that I would say I know we, we discussed this a little bit briefly yesterday, but the evidence is showing that physical therapy can be more beneficial than medications for a lot of pain. So I would definitely give activity or rehabilitation a try. And this is coming from a lot of chronic pain with back pain patients. There was just a recent uh, publication that showed that first line defense with physical therapy instead of pain meds is actually more beneficial. And it's becoming a growing field because pain is becoming a growing field. So my advice would be to seek a professional and maybe try rehab physical exercise. There's a hand up there. Oh. I was just going to respond as well to the last question. Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction was actually started at UMass Medical back in the 70s to treat pain. 
So Dr. John Kabat-Zinn started this with patients that had um, exhausted all the, um, all the medical treatments for reducing their pain. They were either dealing with pain from cancer or back issues or other illnesses. And he started to treat them with meditation and mindfulness. And um, that's actually how his center started and how it, it's grown and has been in for, uh, for over 40 years. So what he actually did was not only helped people by activating the relaxation response, because when you're stressed about pain, your body gets tense. You, you activate that muscle tension in the body, which actually can, in a lot of cases, increase your pain. Um, also, what he treated, too, through mindfulness is our emotional relationship to pain. If that motion, emotional relationship to pain is negative, you're experiencing sadness, anger, frustration, that can also add to the pain. So um, using mindfulness and meditation um, can be helpful in terms of treating chronic pain. Okay, we have somebody up there. All right, I have like two parts to my one question. Um, one thing that I forget the name, but um, the fourth person on the nutrition from the left to the right. Yeah, the female. Oh, yeah. She said um, <laughs> one pound of fat equals three thousand five hundred calories. Yeah. I was wondering how many fat cells that that is. How many fat cells? Well, it's a difference because I'm talking calories. So you're talking about how many fat cells make up 3,500 calories. Yeah, maybe. There, yeah. There's really no, everybody is different. Uh, there are, you are born with a certain amount of cells and as you get older, you can increase the number of fat cells, which can be problematic for people as they get older because they can lose some fat out of the fat cells, but those fat cells don't go away. So there is a propensity to increase the amount of fat in those fat cells. So that's all the more that you need to be mindful about what you're eating and you need to be mindful about physical activity. Because I mean, how can you measure that if you don't know how many fat cells there are? Pardon? How can you measure the calories? Oh, you... measure calories? Every food label, most food labels, all food labels are required to have the amount of calories on it per portion in that container or how many portions they're looking at in that container. So what I always tell people is keep a log or get a fitness app or a calorie app. There's a hundred of them, but there's Calorie King, there's MyFitnessPal. You can plug in most foods that you consume and the amount of the food you're consuming and it'll calculate how many calories, how many grams of fat. You can have apps that will estimate how many calories you need a day or how many calories you need a day to lose weight and it'll deduct those calories throughout the day. So you always have a running total. And I always tell people, be aware of your numbers. Because if at 8 o'clock at night, you're looking at, well, I have 100 calories left to eat. If you didn't know you had 100 calories, you may even grab a brownie, right? Which is a lot more than 100 calories. But all of a sudden, you're thinking, wow, if I could, maybe if I eat an apple, I'm going to meet my goal for that day. So always be aware of your numbers. And those, those apps are beautiful, as well as logs. I guess I'm thinking about it more molecularly. Oh. But um, also, is there any kind of medical service or practice available that um, is thorough and all around and provides attention to all the needs of the patients and, and, and meets all their needs based on expert studies and expert personnel? So um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if what you mean is, but as a survivor at Roswell, you come to the clinic, we do assessments relative to many of the support services, and if you are, a, a, you know, you um, seem to need it and you want to get a referral, we will refer you. So if it's to nutrition, psychology, social work, physical therapy, to yoga, but I think the idea with the survivorship clinic is that we will do a comprehensive assessment, a standard assessment based on evidence, on validated questions, to identify the areas that you may get benefit from, and then 
you know, you don't have to take it, all those recommendations. But we're, we're doing that both in the survivorship clinic and we're also starting to focus for our oncology teams as part of the survivorship care plan for them to do that kind of assessment. Some, someone over here, you want to speak up? Hi, this question is for the oncologist, the breast cancer oncologist. Um, I'm a seven year survivor and I had triple negative cancer. I had the cocktail, the ACT, and I still feel like I'm suffering from chemo brain. Is that true? Is that possible? Yes. <laughs> you don't need how, the oncologist, how long yes. Does it last? <laughs> yeah, and, and what do I do to make it better? <laughs> well, I think that um, I, first we have to. Is this working? Yeah, is that, can you turn that up a bit? I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that the phenomenon of chemo brain is not really fully understood or, you know, as well studied as it certainly needs to be. So the interventions are um, more complicated. That women complain of cognitive dysfunction after chemotherapy, and particularly if they have a menopause as part of treatment, um, is quite common. Um, and there are many strategies that you can take um, in your daily life to try to cope with it. I think to try to eradicate it or make it go away can be very, very difficult. Um, many of my patients find that um, their ability to multitask or do high cognitive tasks is really where they struggle um, and coming up with different mechanisms to trigger memory. Um, a lot of list making, a lot of putting things on calendars, on their apps, on their phones um, can help them deal with multitasking more efficiently. Um, I don't think any of them say that things will completely make it go away. Um, some of the things that I think are useful trying from other literature are things like exercise that are shown to um, increase our cognitive abilities. It's not truly proven in um, breast cancer survivors at this point, but I think it's certainly not harmful and always worth a try. Um, so good sleep, good exercise, a lot of the healthy living um, tips that you'll take away from sessions like this I think are good to incorporate along with some practical strategies for management. We have a question over here. Hi. Um, I think that one of the difficult things um, is even when you know the things that you're spo supposed to be doing, like the meditation and the exercise, is figuring out a way um, to work everything into your day while you're dealing with fatigue and going through treatment and trying to work and manage your family and home. So I'm wondering from a purely practical standpoint, um, from Maria and Dr. Ray, if someone wants to incorporate um, meditation and exercise into their daily routine, um, how you would recommend doing both of those things during the day, um, really specifically like, um, you know, would you encourage someone to um, do meditation and exercise in the morning, or is it more beneficial to exercise in the morning and do meditation at night? You know, how can you manage that within your daily routine? Excuse me. Sorry. That's a question I often get about when is the best time to meditate. Um, I recommend meditating earlier in the day because you're done setting yourself up to live more mindfully throughout the day. Um, you have to schedule meditation. Meditation is one of those things that if you say, I'm gonna find time to meditate, there'll be a thousand other things that are gonna take its place. You'll find a thousand other things that are way more important than taking that time for yourself. So I instruct my students to schedule meditation on their calendars as they would a business meeting or a doctor's appointment and show up for that respectfully for themselves. Um, 10 minutes of meditation every day can be life-changing, so doing that first thing in the morning is, is, the, um, is one of the more beneficial times to do it, but that doesn't mean that it isn't beneficial other times of the day. Especially if people that are dealing with sleep issues, um, doing meditation before they go to sleep. A lot of my students, one of the first things that they report is that they sleep better once they start a meditation program, and that's not um, whether they do it in the morning and night, that's just whether they do it at all. So it is something that you have to schedule, um, and really working that out in your day when that's gonna be the best time. So maybe you thought doing it in the morning was gonna be good for a particular day, but you were fatigued, then um, you know, schedule it at night. A meditation in the beginning, a lot of times, will per, uh, 
provoke sleep, right? So people will start a meditation, they'll say, oh, I, I fell asleep during it. And I say, well, that's okay. You just needed a really good nap. So if you fall asleep during your meditation, you want to try to do it sometime later in the day when you're more wakeful. <laughs> There's nothing easy about exercise when I, in starting. I will sit here and I'll tell you over and over again that exercise is the best medicine you can prescribe for yourself. The challenge is doing it, and I understand that. So the recommended guidelines say you should have 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. Remember, you do not need to do that all at once, too. Set goals, set a time, make yourself feel accountable for some reason. And maybe start with five minutes or 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night. You don't, remember you don't need to do it all at once. What works for some people might not work for others, but working with a partner, a friend, a family member to make yourself accountable is one way. Set goals, like Carol said, start with small goals. Maybe you wanna sign up for a 5K or a walk. Uh, I'm not saying go run a 5K, but sometimes those they force you to do things. And once you do it, trust me, it will be easier. But you have to schedule the time to do it. And it might be easier to start by not doing it all at once, but doing five, 10 minute blocks a day and accumulate your minutes that way. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, and I just have one other quick question for Dr. O'Connor. Um, I'm just wondering how the survivorship program here at Roswell has been presented to the doctors um, so how aware are they of all the services that are being provided and how are they presenting that to their patients? Um, I think we're still very much in the launch phase, but I think there's a great deal of enthusiasm uh, for the program throughout the oncology um, providers at Roswell, um, as evidenced by the number of referrals that have already been made. There's clearly a lot of patients that are going to benefit um, from these programs. And, you know, for all oncologists, I. There's no doubt that every patient I see deserves a lot of time and attention. Um, when you're in a busy clinic, a woman who's on a quick follow-up visit can sometimes get the short shift if she's doing okay and you've got four other people in rooms with progressing cancer you know, that need to have difficult discussions today. So I think it represents a really special place um, to offer a lot of care that needs to be um, delivered. and to give people the time and the care that they need. So I think that it's being presented in a very um, open way to the oncologists at Roswell, and I don't see any uh, resistance to the idea. Some of us are, we don't want to lose touch with our patients because we have long-term relationships with them, but there's no reason, like in everything else in life, we can't share. I also want to tell you that I'm a complete failure at doing any of these exercise and diet things personally. <laughs> and the only mantra that ever works for me is life is a long series of comebacks. You just can't give up. <laughs> okay, up here. First, I'd like to say thank you so much for Roswell. You've been a tremendous blessing to my family. I'm sitting here because of all your teamwork and whoever put this all together is just absolutely the fantastic Roswell team. I mean, thank you. Really are, really are. And us survivors, you guys, re we really need to give ourselves a hand. It's hard to get here mm -hmm. as yeah. a survivor with our families. We really do. We, this is the step in the right direction. This, all these workshops are, are such a blessing. I absorbed so much from that movie yesterday, and I'm, I'm stuck on some of the visuals that the, that the uh, producer took personal time and um, personal expression to help us to move forward in our survivorship. And I'm extremely grateful for all their life stories and her life works and, and Dr. David's life work. And um, I hope that everybody walks away with something that gives them accountability and the strength to just keep, keep on keeping on. That's all you can do. And in order to do that, it was brought to my attention because I really love science. Um, the amount of toxins that were presented by cartoons, but not information. So my question is to anybody on the board that would um, share with us, I saw Febreze, um, I saw Pam spray, that contained butane. 
Um, but that was really it. In you know, in every day, as a, a woman that loves cleaning and the smell of pledge, um, <laughs> I just I don't know everything that's in pledge, but it, it's wonderful when you're done cleaning. So, you know, in your departments, is there a particular toxin that you think um, you would recommend us to stay away from the mostly? Because I know my hairspray. I'm going to be on fire today if there's anything. Any, I'm going to just light up. It's not a problem. But the You're cleaners really and stuff, is there anything that you, you totally would never use at Roswell because you are a cancer institute? Well, I'm just going to say uh, smoke. First of all, smoking, being around smokers, being around e-cigarettes. Um, I'm just going to have to put the plug in because that's the biggest carcinogenic exposure that we all get. I just came from Scotland. Holy cow, you know. Uh, you get a lot of exposure secondhand, third hand. Uh, that is one to absolutely stay away from. I'll, I'll leave it to the panel for the rest. Stephen, do you have any? Um, again, an excellent question, which we don't have any definitive answers. Uh, yes, I do think one should be cautious about um, manufactured cleaning products that uh, have artificial additives. It's not as if we have anything clear cut that they can cause cancer. They can certainly, some people, cause respiratory problems. And there is this uh, unusual environmental syndrome which definitely occurs. People get sick when exposed to uh, certain chemicals. But we are learning all the time. I mean, for example, uh, there's a big push. I mean, in Ontario now, they ban um, um, pesticides and herbicides. Uh, ironically, except on golf courses, which I find ironic. <laughs> and, and they're still allowed to use them on farms, which I also find ironic, but in domestic situations, can't use them. Because there's no doubt that, uh, is that, that, that pesticides uh, increase the incidence of um, lymphoma. And, um, you know, this is, the, 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 and there's also some evidence for breast cancer as well. So we do need to be cautious. We do need more epidemiological evidence. And I think we really just have to be on guard and we have to keep asking those uh, questions. Um, what, what, what do I do in my house? Well, um, my, my wife tends to go for things like uh, natural sage products, you know. Um, if you don't have any sensitivity to that, it seems reasonable. Um, but, the, but, but once you get to the industrial manufactured products, I think one has to be cautious because we just, we just don't know. We have a question down here. You know, the, the title of this is a cancer survivors workshop. What have we done in terms of researching individuals who had terrible prognosis and yet they survived and did well? Um, what have we learned? Has anybody ever studied the survivors that have done well and what were the ingredients that um, help them? Were they optimists? Um, you know, why did they survive versus somebody who had similar or, or not even as bad a diagnosis? And those people have died off and yet these individuals have survived. I mean, I think there has been a lot that we're learning about um, genetics of cancer um, rather than genetics of the individual. Um, and I think as time moves forward, we'll understand more about an individual's cancer that despite um, presenting in an advanced stage is um, unusually responsive to certain treatments um, versus the opposite, the cancers that present a very early stage that are unresponsive to our therapies. Um, so I think we've come a long way in understanding that. Um, there's a very you know, interesting um, field of breast cancer research and it applies to other tumor types as well of something called tumor dormancy. Why can tumor cells lie in wait for decades, as it were, in parts of our body in a reservoir and then suddenly become active um, many, many years after treatment? Um, so I think there are advances being made in many of these areas. Why one poor soul with stage two breast cancer succumbs within 18 months and another lives for you know, 40 years? Um, no one has all of those answers yet. I, I don't want to discount optimism or the you know, the importance of taking care of oneself. But I do think that many of these um, things have more to do with tumor biology and 
um, response to treatment than they necessarily do with one's outlook, but that's just my perspective as an oncologist. We like to think that we have a lot of control over everything, and sometimes we don't. Um, I don't think my patients who die quickly have done anything wrong. I think they're merely unlucky. Yes, down here. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, enjoying these two days more than I ever expected I would. I've been to some of these conferences before. Um, last year was good. Some years we had them in the park and we ate cotton candy and saw clowns. You know, and I think today we're going away with much more information. Um, I came here as a 27-year-old girl. And I say girl because I was in 1979. I came as a DES daughter. DES is the drug that my, our mothers took that caused cancers in daughters. And I was diagnosed with something else in 1981, and I am a, uh, a patient in many, many clinics here, many. And I have outlived some of my doctors who told me I wasn't gonna be here, who told me I wasn't gonna be here a long time ago. So I'm very grateful for the fact that there's an institutional and organizational effort that I see now. I do remember years past certain doctors closing the door and not wanting others to hear messages, you know. And I think we, we need to be very, very um, encouraged by the fact that there's not just a day like today, but it seems to me like there's a direction that we're going in. And uh, I'm very, very glad to say. I'm glad I hung out. And I'm glad everybody here wants to do the same thing. So can, can I go back to her question? So it may not relate to someone who remarkably survives a stage four cancer, but can, can we talk about this mind, body, physical tumor interaction and sort of how, what, what that, how that plays and, and because I, I think it also goes to some, some of the attitude and how you approach the treatment and survivorship. And I, I don't want to lose the opportunity because we have the whole set of people on the stage. Can, can you guys kind of comment or some, can someone comment on that? <clears throat> The, the rich. Oh God. <laughs> it must be a mind-body effect. Um, there was an original piece of research, um, probably about uh, 18 years ago, by David Spiegel, who was a psychiatrist, that looked at the survival of breast cancer patients, really advanced breast cancer patients, with mind-body groups and expression. And there was a sort of a quirk on a sub-analysis that those who received um, the, uh, the mind-body expression lived longer. Further studies, certainly done in Canada by Goodwin and Atel, uh, showed that this could not be generalized. And in the end, it was thought that there were some flaws in the uh, analysis. So for a period of time, it was thought that mind-body effects weren't important. But it's more complicated than that. Uh, more recent uh, research has shown that um, good psychosocial support, uh, good improvement in lifestyle does overall increase survival, but you can't actually predict who is going to survive longer than the other because there are so many factors. I mean, even though these are randomized studies, so you're assuming that you get the same prognostic groups uh, in each arm, control versus intervention, uh, it's still difficult to differentiate who is going to benefit most. But the way I see it is uh, from the perspective of uh, Pascal's wager. If you're going to do um, these activities, um, apart from taking up some of your time, which is important because it gives you a break from all the other stresses you have, um, the reality is, is that it's only going to increase your health overall. It is going to reduce any symptoms, any long-term adverse effects of your cancer treatment. It is going to help other um, uh, disorders such as cardiovascular disease and metabolic diseases like diabetes. Uh, and you are going to feel better and you are going to feel more in control of your life. And that's the most important thing, in my opinion, about survivorship is the unpredictability, the roller coaster that every time you go to an appointment, you wonder, are you going to get bad news? 
Uh, all of these uh, interventions, these basic interventions, whether exercise, meditation, etc., you find the ones that suit you, but they will allow you to be calmer and more resilient and to actually deal with the um, roller coaster of your emotions. It will help to stabilize you and thereby improve your quality of life. So the simple answer is that we don't know, does it improve survival? There's some evidence, yes, but uh, even if it didn't, then it still has major benefits to uh, your quality of life. Thanks. So we have two more questions, one up there and then someone down here. Okay, so you'll be second, okay. And then we're gonna break and then again, hunt these people down if you have some more, uh, you want more information. Yes, um, I was just wondering how this chapter two is presented to um, a patient. Is it part of the questionnaire when they come into the clinic and after initially, and then as they're going on with their treatment, do they constantly like get reminders that this, all this program's available? Because initially I was just wanted the surgery and the chemo and I wasn't thinking of anything else as far as, you know, all these other aspects of my treatment and my recovery. And also, is it available for um, like people? It's been like 16 years since I was a patient here. So am I allowed to come in and utilize this program as well as long as my, you know, my insurance and whatever will cover? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes. Uh, you, you know, you, um, you know, uh, are a Roswell patient. You are always welcome here. If you want to make a, an appointment, you call the Ask Our PCI number, tell them you want to be seen in survivorship. For many of you, like, who have long-term survivors, your, your primary oncologist is no longer here, and we've adapted the referral, the self-referral portion of that, so that you can come in and get an assessment. I mean, you may have, you know, a few issues you want to talk about, or at least get an idea of what's available, and you are certainly welcome to do that. In addition, we will get you, make sure you're on track for all of the other appropriate screenings that you need for cancer because we know when you've survived breast cancer you forget that you have a cervix and it needs to be ev evaluated or you have a colon and you know because you've been distracted and so we want to make sure that you're up to date on all of that as well so you are you know so for people as they come off treatment they will be getting a care plan within six months of finishing treatment and it both will summarize your treatment and it will also provide an opportunity for you and your oncologist to talk about what services you need it doesn't mean that you stop seeing your oncologist because you may see them for two to three years after treatment and we don't want to interfere with that relationship we do want your oncology team to provide you with the roadmap so you know how frequently you need to come in. You can share this with your family. It will go on the portal. It can be mailed to you, however you want it. But it also provides you for an opportunity to say, OK, send me to survivorship, or I'll send you to survivorship, and they'll look into getting you networked into a bunch of other support services so that as you become a survivor, you move into this sort of proactive phase. Because the earlier you start to change or to incorporate new ways of dealing with cancer, the better it's going to be in the long run because it does, it, it does affect your survival. So that was a great question. Um, and the last question. Um, hi. I just wanted to ask um, if there was like a timeline on like supposedly, I call it grieving in a sense. Um, I have four sisters who everything's new to me. Like I had my... Um, was blindsided like a lot of people are and did everything right and um, had my diagnosis, had my surgery, radiation, and literally the day after we got the news that they thought they got all the cancer, um, my family was all like calling and saying, oh, that's great news or praise God, whatever, you know, we're so glad. And then that was it. And they're not realizing that, okay, number one, I'm associated with cancer now. Number two, I have all these side effects and a new body image. Um, you know, it was traumatic for me. Um, you know, now I've ended up with, you know, lymphedema, all this other stuff that they, you know, they do know some of it. But I get a lecture every time if I happen to be having a bad day or, you know, because I have good and bad days, like everybody. 
and you know, if I'll happen to be crying or something, I'll get a whole lecture about, what's the matter with you? You're alive. Why aren't, you know, be thankful you're alive. You could be, you know, in the ground right now, or you could be stage four, you know, just, you know, be grateful. What's the matter with you? So then I start thinking to myself, well, goodness, is something wrong with me? Do I need professional help? You know, because, you know, is there a certain timeline where I should be? You know, I mean, for one, I'm still going through the side effects that nobody told me about, about which are bad. You know, they're bad to me because now I'm a whole different person. But when they tell me, you know, I have four sisters and each one of them at different times have said, well, maybe you need to get some help. Well, I'm laughing half the time, but there is going to be days where it's still traumatic and that's a huge thing, but they see it totally as they think they got all your cancer and it's done. And so, is there a timeline? I mean, I, I think what you're experiencing is extremely normal, and I think the way your family reacting is very normal too, because it feels good to think, oh, it's over, it's done with, we don't have to think about it anymore. And in a sense, they don't have to. But that cancer shadow that you're living underneath uh, is very real. I was shocked when I finished my chemotherapy. I had weekly chemotherapy for six months, and I thought, oh, good, this is all over, everything's going to be wonderful. It was harder emotionally when I finished my treatment than it was during. Nobody ever told me that. That's back in 1991. You know, they weren't all these resources. And what I found is very important, and what I ended up starting was a cancer support group. I really encourage you. The American Cancer Society, you know, has them. I'm sure Roswell has resources here to let you know if you're looking for a faith-based one. I have those listed on my website by state. And I, I, it's really important to come with other people that you find out, oh, I'm not crazy, you know? And it's good to bring your family members if they would come with you, because they hear these other people and they go, oh, she's not crazy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that that support is huge. And it's important to, um, uh, you know, to recognize that you're living in the, ca in the shadow of cancer. And there, there are things that you can do, and a lot of these workshops will give you some practical suggestions. But the very quick question is that that's very real, and um, to continue to have that range of emotions is very, very common. So um, this is a great session. Thank you for your questions. I, I did go over a few minutes, so we do have a break, and we'll see you again as close to 11 as you can for care plans. Thank you.